Chautauqua 2010 is brought to you by the Maryland Humanities Council, a private educational nonprofit organization that stimulates and promotes informed dialogue and civic engagement on issues critical to Marylanders. Welcome, I'm Angela Rice Beamer and we're here at the Germantown campus of Montgomery College for a living history program called Chautauqua. You might be wondering what a Chautauqua actually is. Well, it's a program where a scholar actor portrays a famous person in history. This year's theme is Beyond Boundaries and tonight's Chautauqua character was an interpreter, wife, mother, and on one expedition she was a symbol of peace. She's one of the most famous women in American history. In school, you may have learned her name as Sacagawea, but in her language, she's Sacagawea. Sangu, Yayaka, Nisasona, Nia Nania, Sacagawea. Bonsoir, mesdames et monsieur. Permettez-moi de me présenter. Je m'appelle Sagagawea. Je suis content de vous connaître. Du Sha'a. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sagagawea. It is Hidatsa. Sagaga means bird, and Wea means woman. And I was asked to come here this evening to visit with you to tell you some stories about when I traveled west with Captain Meriwether Lewis and Captain William Clark and the men that traveled with them. They were traveling west to look for what they called an ocean and a great waterway to that ocean. My man Charbonneau was hired as an interpreter on that great voyage and Charbonneau thought that I too could serve as an interpreter. I am Shoshone, and when I was very young, I was taken from my Shoshone people to live with the Hidatsa people. And so I know how to speak the Shoshone language. And now that I have lived for several years with the Hidatsa people, I can speak the Hidatsa language. My man Charbonneau is a French voyageur, a French fur trader. So je parle un peu de français. I speak a little bit of French. I know Indian sign language. And now that I have traveled out west and back with the captains and their men, I speak a little bit of the English language. Tonight, I will try to speak English because I heard that most of you are English. Am I right? So you will forgive my English if it's not right. Thank you. When I traveled out west with the captains and their men, I had just given birth to our firstborn child, Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau.
This was at the Fort Mandan. And two months later, we took off on that great voyage. Those men marveled at how I carried Jean Baptiste in a cradle board on my back. But that is how most of the women in the Hadatsa village carry their babies. Jean Baptiste was the only child on that voyage, and I, Sagagawea, was the only woman. This evening, I should like to tell you some stories that are about water. Many times, water was our friend and very helpful in our voyage, but other times, water was our enemy and became very dangerous. The first story I want to tell you is about when we were traveling in the boat that they called the Great Pirogue, it was a very, very wide boat and a very long boat. And the men would sometimes use a sail to catch the wind to make it go. Sometimes the men would use long poles to push and pull the boats. Other times they would use ropes to pull the boats, they would be in the water or on the shore pulling those boats. And other times, they would row. This time, they had the sail up. Now, this boat was the boat that the captains called the sturdiest and the safest boat. And for that reason, the captains and the men had put most of the equipment and the supplies in that boat. Oh, they traveled with so many things. They had food and equipment, maps and charts and diaries. They had things that they would trade with the Indians, bits of ribbon and furs buttons, medals, beads, material. They also had food and great measuring devices. Those captains measured everything. They measured the ground. They measured trees. They measured animals, birds, waters, lakes, and streams, and rivers. They even measured the moon and the stars. I thought it quite silly. <laughs> Most of those items were in this great white pirogue because it was the safest and the sturdiest boat. I was toward the back of the boat. My man Charbonneau was in the back steering the boat. Several other men were in the front. Now, Captain Lewis and Captain Clark would travel separately, but this time they were traveling together on horses on shore. And the river was very wide at this point. They were far away. The sun had set. And the waves were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And a powerful wind came and took that sail and caused that boat that we were in to tip on its side. And the water began to rush in. My man Charbonneau did not know how to swim. He pleaded to his God for mercy. Mon Dieu, mon Dieu, have mercy on me. I cannot swim. Two other men in the boat could not swim. Far away on shore, the captains could see what was taking place. 
Captain Lewis told us later that he began to take his clothes off to come and swim to try to save us. He said it was great folly. Captain Lewis and Captain Clark got their rifles out and fired a shot. Captain Lewis told us later that he yelled, keep your wits about you men, keep your wits about you, lower the sail, lower the sail. But we were so far from the captains that we did not hear their shots and we did not hear them yell. John Baptiste was in his cradle board on my back and my hands were free. So as those supplies and equipment that were packaged very well began to float away, I grabbed as many things as I could to try to save them. The men finally were able to lower that great sail. But by the time they did, the boat was this close to being full of water. They slowly rowed to the shore, and when they got to the shore, they took all of the supplies and equipment out, built a great fire, and put the, the items around the fire to try and dry everything out. It rained the next day. Up until that time, Captain Lewis had not been very friendly to me. But after I was able to save some of the supplies and equipment, he warmed up to me a bit. <laughs> and a few days later, the captains and the men named a river after me, Sagagawea. The next story that I should like to tell you is not just about water that is on the ground, like a river, but water that comes from the sky. We were a small party. I was traveling with my man Charbonneau and Jean Baptiste. Captain Clark was with us, as was his manservant York. York was big medicine, very strong, and he had gone ahead to hunt for buffalo. York was a very good hunter. We were traveling above a great and powerful waterfall. Captain Clark had measured it and said it was 87 feet tall. York was hunting and we were above that waterfall when we looked to the west and there was a dark cloud rising. And we knew that a storm was coming. We knew danger was coming our way. We had seen the storms in that area. So we began to look for shelter. Captain Clark and my man Charbonneau looked down in a ravine that was above that great waterfall and found a spot that we climbed down into and found a spot that was like a cave with a ledge and we could stand up in it. Captain Clark took his gun and shot pouch and put it on the ground and my man Charbonneau took his gun and shot pouch and put it on the ground and I took Jean Baptiste out of his cradle board and after a while, a soft rain began to fall. But we stayed safe and dry in our spot that was like a cave with a ledge. But then the rain began to pound harder and harder on the ground. And then the lightning was so bright that it hurt our eyes and the thunder was so loud that it began to hurt our ears. 
but we still stayed safe and dry in our spot that was like a cave. Then Captain Clark yelled, run for your lives, run as fast as you can, climb to the top of the ravine. We looked and there was a wall of water that was coming our way and it was pushing everything in front of it. Rocks and boulders and limbs, trees. All I had time to do was grab Jean Baptiste. My man Charbonneau grabbed my arm and we began to climb to the top of that ravine. Captain Clark was behind me. One hand had a hold of Charbonneau, the other had a hold of the baby. I turned and I looked. Captain Clark was pushing me from behind as we were climbing. The water had already come to his waist and it wet his watch. And I looked and the water was turning and churning and it was dark and muddy and had sticks and stones and everything in it. And it looked evil. We got to the top and we were wet and hungry and cold, and we looked down to where we had just been and saw that it was full of water. And had we stayed there, that wall of water would have taken us over that great waterfall. York saw the storm coming too, and he found us. He was so happy to see us, he had been worried about us. The water had swept away the men's gun and shot pouch, but Captain Clark had grabbed his gun first, and the water swept away Jean Baptiste's cradleboard. We met with the other men, and they did not find shelter, and some of those men did not even have clothes on, so the rain that was falling had turned into what the men called hail, and the hail hit them on the heads and the arms, and they, it cut them and caused some of the men to fall down. It almost killed some of the men. The next day, Captain Clark sent two of the men to the bottom of that waterfall to look for the things that we had lost. But they did not find Charbonneau's gun, and they did not find Jean Baptiste's cradleboard, and they did not find Captain Clark's umbrella, but they did find his large compass buried in the mud and the sand. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we met many dangers on that trip. There were good times, though. I liked it when the men would build a fire and they would tell stories. Cruzat would get his fiddle out and he would play a tune. The men would drink the grog and they would dance a funny jig around the fire. Jean Baptiste would sit on my lap and laugh at the men while they danced. The happiest time was when I met with my people, the Shoshone people. I was surprised to see that the leader of the Shoshone people was my brother, Camulet. I took my shawl and put it on his shoulders. I was so happy to see him. I had not seen him in a very long time. He told me that Many of my family had been killed, and that made me very sad. I learned that my sister's son was still alive, and I took him as my own. But although my family, many of them were gone, I was still happy to be with the Shoshone people, and I was able to help in the interpreting and negotiating that the captains and the men needed to get the horses 
to go over the great silvery mountains. When we would speak, the captains would speak in English, and they would speak in English to Labiche, and Labiche knew English and French. And Labiche would speak in French to my man, Charbonneau. Charbonneau knew French and Hidatsa. And Charbonneau would speak to me in Hidatsa. And I knew Hidatsa and Shoshone, and I would speak to my brother and the other people in Shoshone. It took all day. <laughs> but I was very happy to help get the horses needed for that voyage. And then we got over the great snowy mountains. And when we got to the other side, it rained and it rained and it rained. It seemed to rain every day. Everything was wet. The men were hungry and cold. Captain Clark was not himself. I had been saving a little piece of bread in my pocket. I had thought I would save it for Jean Baptiste, and it was the real bread the bread that the men valued. It was not the bread made from the pounded root. This was the bread made from the flour that the men liked. I had been saving it for Jean Baptiste, but I thought Captain Clark needed it. I thought it would cheer him up. So I took my piece of bread out of my pocket, and I offered it to that Captain Clark. And do you know what Captain Clark did? Do you know? <laughs> Captain Clark took my piece of bread, put it in his mouth, chewed it up, swallowed it, and said, why, Sagagawea, that bread is wet. When we got close to what the men called the ocean, we met with some men that were Chinook Indians. There was one Chinook Indian who had the most beautiful coat made from the skin of two sea otters. And the captains wanted that coat. The captains wanted that coat more than anything. I told you that the captains carried many items to trade with the Indians. And sometimes the captains would give medals to the leaders or the chiefs of the Indians. And if there were no chiefs or Indians, the captains would make one a chief or an Indian, and give them the medals anyway. But this Chinook Indian did not want bits of ribbon or buttons or beads or even the military coats or the hat. There was only one thing that that Chinook Indian wanted, and that was the blue chief beads. But the men had long run out of blue chief beads. But the captains had the men look through all of the supplies and the equipment and their pockets and their hats to see if they could find some blue chief beads. But they found none until one man saw that the belt that I had was made of blue chief beads. 
So the captains took my belt. And the Chinook Indian got his blue chief beads, and the captains got the most beautiful coat made from the skin of two sea otters. And I was left without a belt. After a few days, the captains gave me a coat made of blue cloth. But it did not keep me as dry as the coat made from the skin of two sea otters. And it did not keep me as warm. I do not know why the captains thought if that Chinook Indian did not want that coat made of blue cloth, why I would want that coat made of blue cloth. I do not think that the captains thought I knew much about trading, but I did. When we got very, very close to the great waters called an ocean, the captains made preparations to go to the shore. The men had heard rumors of a monstrous fish, a monstrous fish called a whale. And when they prepared to go, they did not include me. Oh, how so very hard to travel so far away and not be able to see the great waters called an ocean and the monstrous fish called a whale. So I insisted that I be included and the captains finally relented and allowed me to go. But by the time we arrived to the ocean, there was nothing left of that monstrous fish but bones. But oh, those bones, why, they stretched and stretched and stretched. They stretched from one end of this great room clear to the other end. It was the most wondrous thing I had ever seen. Sometimes when I close my eyes, I can still feel that ocean water on my toes and feel the sand. And I can smell that water and taste that salt. Ladies and gentlemen, there were many things that happened on that great voyage. But Captain Clark has written a letter to my man Charbonneau asking us to come to St. Louis to try to live there in what they call a city. And he wants to educate Jean Baptiste. So Charbonneau said we might do that. And he is thinking about traveling to St. Louis. I have many stories to tell. There were many things that happened. But I fear that for now I have taken up much of your time. And I would like to thank you for listening to my stories. And perhaps we can talk if you have questions about my voyage that I joined with Captain Clark and his men. So I thank you so much for coming and visiting with me. Hello, I'm Angela Rice Beamer here with Celine Phillips, who's done a wonderful performance as Sakagawea. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. What were uh, things in her personality that may be similar to yours? What, shows, what uh, caused you to choose her as a character to perform? Well, I don't know. We, we don't know much about her personality, except that she was probably very generous and outgoing and um, kind. And 
I'd like to think of all those things, but I don't necessarily know if we have a lot in common or not. We have the fact that she was an indigenous woman, a Shoshone woman, and lived with the Hidatsa people. And I'm a, an Ojibwe woman who went, eventually went to Purdue University, which is a completely different culture, and I'm in a completely different culture as a professor at a major university, which is very different than my home. So in that way, you could say, I have something in common with her. I sometimes say that I didn't choose her as much as maybe she chose me. My good friend Charles Pace has been a Chautauquan for a long time. He's been here. Yes, he has. And he asked me if I would consider doing a Chautauqua a long time ago, about 25 years ago. And so I've always toyed with the idea. And then there was the opportunity to portray Sagagawea. And so I told him I would consider it. And I did. And so eventually, now I'm doing her. Do you do any, her. Do you do any other characters? I she the recently did Mary Todd Lincoln. Oh. They're totally opposite in that with Sagagawea, she never wrote language languages, and there, there's nothing much written except Clark did write how she was um, insisted upon going to see the the ocean and the whale. So that's about as close as to her own voice as we get. However, compare that to Mary Todd Lincoln, who we have volumes of her letters that she wrote to friends and her relationship with President Lincoln, very much in the public eye. Sagagawea, at the time when she was traveling, was treated more like the woodwork. She was a woman, she was a native woman, she was not a US citizen. So she was significant and very important on the voyage, but in some ways not valued. And women in general weren't valued at that time. And then we switched to someone who's a first lady who was in the spotlight and criticized most of her life, and, but yet a very smart woman who wrote a lot. So from a Chautauquan standpoint, they come to the way the, to approach becoming and interpreting those two women very opposite. You talked about it a little bit, about the research process. Was it difficult? and I imagine it was very difficult, but talk to us a little bit about the research process of uh, uh, researching someone who, whose voice you don't really hear in their own words, who, whose voice is told through someone else or others, various others. I talked with Hidatsa women and I've talked with some Shoshone. I'd like to talk with some more Shoshone people to get mo more of their input, but I tried to preface, preface the, the visual and the, the feeling and, and the interpreting of what Lewis and Clark did and of what they wrote from an indigenous standpoint. So in other words, the, the diaries are obsessed with measuring things and writing the weather and things like that. And from an indigenous standpoint, maybe that's not the most important thing. Maybe the most important thing are the relationships between people and the culture and getting along. And pretty much the, the men in the voyage came out there thinking, we've got power and might and people have to reconcile themselves with us without much consideration for the systems that were already in place. Right, right. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the Shoshone culture uh, and, uh, and the Hadatsa culture uh, in general. You, you've, you've talked a little bit about it, but a, a little bit more uh, at the time. The Shoshone people traveled and, and hunted, hunted food, and that was contrasted greatly with the Hidatsa people. The women were the farmers, and they had this intricate village, uh, an, a, a, a little town, if you will, that was larger and more efficient than Washington, D.C. at the time. And um, there are pictures of where, where artists came and would draw them, and, and I just think they're beautiful, the, the Mandan and Hidatsa villages. And that contrasts with what, at the time, and this is not my opinion, but this is other scholars and people at the time were writing that Washington, D.C. was a swamp and was, had sewer in the streets and s smelled bad and just was not a very hospitable place. So, hospitable place. And so there's a lot of contrast there between the, how the Shoshone lived, how the Hidatsa lived, and then a place like Washington, D.C. Was it common for women to be so adventurous? And it, it, I would consider it adventurous, but uh, did... Uh, I don't consider her adventurous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 
I just consider her a woman who was doing what Native women did, and that was being supportive of children, being supportive of other Native women, doing their duties, pleasing their family, working toward consensus, and um, being cooperative and, and, and working together. Um, the children's books that we read now about her will say she was heroic and she was adventurous and she had all these traits that we should all emulate, but actually she probably was not that different than many Native women at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was her relationship like uh, uh, to Charbonneau? Th and, and because you're hearing it through others, was I, you know what I want to ask you? I want to ask you about the oral history. What were you getting through the oral histories of the Hadatsa and the Shoshone people from that indigenous standpoint? Well, I started by asking them, the, the big question when you start is, does she carry a cradle board or does she carry a shawl or did she even have either one of those to begin with? So I had asked a lot of the Hidatsa women and most of them thought that she did carry a cradle board. Now Clark writes in his diary when uh, I talk about the wall of water story she loses the B-I-E-R he writes, he writes, she loses that. Well the, and that's a cradle board, so why would he lie about that? He, there's no reason for him to exaggerate or to make that up, so I'm assuming, and as many scholars are, that she did carry a cradle board. The Hidatsa also had a way of carrying it with a shawl. They had, would have a shawl that they would wrap the baby and they could put him in various positions. And actually, I just read where uh, someone was doing a new study on how the cradle board and these shawls are very efficient. And, and make a lot of sense for children because they feel like they're already in the womb, they're safe, and the cradle boards are quite heavy. They're, they're about 30 pounds when, when they're made properly and there's some um, that have been made uh, in, in North Dakota uh, around where they do a lot of Lewis and Clark um, reenacting and, and things like that. And so there's many native people who've made cr cradle boards since then too. With the, um, let's go back to the question about Charbonneau. What was her relationship like? And, and because she uh, didn't tell it in her own words, it, you, you mentioned that where her husband goes, she goes. I, I guess I'm just, I don't think she had a lot of choices. A lot of people will ask me, well, why didn't she stay with, she met with the, up with the Shoshone people. Why didn't she stay with the Shoshone people? And I always ask people, well, you're married and you go home and you visit your mom and dad and your friends from high school or whoever, why don't you stay home? Her, her place, I'm, I'm sure she probably didn't even think, should I stay here with the Shoshone people? Her place was probably with her family at that time, which would have been Charbonneau's other wives if, if he had them and many people think he did, and, and Jean Baptiste raising him with his father. Um, we really don't know if they totally got along and were in love, or if, if she couldn't stand it. We really don't, don't know the details. But there is something in the Lewis and Clark Diaries that refers to um, Lewis, I think, got upset with him for striking her. And we don't know if that was a one-time thing or if he, he was a cruel person in that regard. But we do know that even at that time, even in the 1970s and 80s and even the, into the 90s, we don't talk about domestic violence. So I'm sure at that time that was going on many more places than, than Charbonneau and Sagagawea, both non-native and non-native. So um, we really don't know a lot about their relationship. But I would imagine uh, as cooperative as she seemed to be, that she was easy to get along with and, and worked again toward a consensus. And Charbonneau was also a, a, seemed to be a very bright individual, maybe, maybe in his own way stubborn at times, as um, many of the men in the expedition could be, uh, uh, according to the diaries. But he um, was enterprising enough that he went to the Lewis and Clark, uh, to, to where they were at, at Fort Mandan, to see about getting some work. So, he was a good enough provider to be in, um, ingenious enough to say, okay, well, here's an opportunity for us to make some money, and here's an opportunity for us to better ourselves. Jean Baptiste, uh, Clark uh, offered to raise him. 
Uh, he offered to educate him. To educate Huge him. difference okay. because I don't think, I don't think he stayed in their home. A lot of people think he just got to stay in the home, but I think he went to a boarding school precursor to the, the boarding schools that many Native people were forced to go to, which was, for the most part, not a pleasant experience. So it's very doubtful that Mrs. Clark would have wanted Jean Baptiste under her foot and in her home. He might, might have visited often, but I doubt if he was in, embraced and brought into their home and treated like one of their ch children. Very interesting because uh, the, uh, our times would have it very different than that. But well, yeah, we, that's very and that's one of the insight, that yeah. is one of the problems with the whole Lewis and Clark tale is we get something like that and we get a tidbit of information and then we interpret it in modern day uh, what we think would happen today or what we would hope would happen and we forget that, for example, Sagagawea was not an American. York was still a slave. Um, Jean Baptiste was the child of a Native American, of a Shoshone Hidatsa, culturally Hidatsa uh, woman and a French voyageur, and probably in all circles wasn't, wasn't treated with due respect. York de definitely wasn't. York wanted to have his freedom, wasn't allowed his freedom. So it's really important to remember what was going on at that time. Um, have you made the journey that, that they made? Not the entire journey, parts. Mm -hmm. parts mm -hmm. of what it. parts of it have you? And, and um, in what North did you Dakota find and most South Dakota, surprising, Nebraska. or what were some of your impressions? Hmm. The Missouri is is interesting and fun, and it was it was summertime. I, I think I had a much easier time than, than they had, but it gave me a, a sense of. of uh, a feeling and a respect, but I'm, much, I'm very much an outdoor person, and um, at, from my home in Lac du Flambeau, I'm outdoors a lot, and I, I just absolutely love being outdoors and being on the water and canoeing and boating and doing things like that. What is Lac du, du Flambeau but like? It, we have one of the largest chain of lakes in the world. There are some others that are larger, but it's, it's large, beautiful. I, you, you travel and you've got water to the right and to the left and to the, to, to your, to the front of you. And there's um, ice fishing and fishing um, year-round, uh, boating, swimming, canoeing, I, uh, snow, snowshoeing cross-country skiing, so outdoors plays a very um, strong part in Ojibwe culture from Lac du Flambeau. Hunting, all those things I love to do. Do you have a particular uh, opinion about the stories of her death, that she died at 25, she died at 82, perhaps? I sometimes am fascinated how obsessed people are with, with those kind of stories and those kind of details. Um, I forget there was a term that we used to call it, the, the Lewis and Clark, like Trekkies. That, that would be so obsessed with, well, when did so and so die? When did they? When did so and so live? And and we sometimes forget the most important lessons about something like Lewis and Clark, which is, which which may be in um, in the Great Plains Chautauqua. One of the things that we would often talk about when we would would mention democracy, we'd talk about how, what are some of the similarities and differences between the Lewis and Clark expedition and Iraq. So, let's talk about that. Are there similarities? Are there differences? What have we learned from that first voyage to a, this new kind of voyage? And, and should we be comparing and contrasting? Because if we don't learn from history, what good is studying history? So um, those are the things that, in some ways, I'm kind of disappointed we had that bicentennial commi commemoration, and some of those discussions were not taken as far as they could have been taken, and some people obsessed with, well, Lewis and Clark were here, but they weren't here. Sagagawea was here, but she wasn't here. Right, right. Well, it, it's good to open the discussion, and I hope you're able to share uh, your performances with many others, and many others across the country. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Angela. And thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. I'm Angela Rice Beamer from the Germantown campus of Montgomery College. Our theme has been Beyond Boundaries. For all of us here at the Germantown campus of Montgomery College, good night. Mm -hmm.